we oh. are going to win this for our coaches. Like we were so pumped about it and like we were there, you know, and then to kind of get all the way there and not win it again was that like big letdown and like you could yeah. just feel the hurt and everybody and like there's. I think the minute I stepped on our practice field for rugby, the calling happened. Uh, an eight year plan to be on the team. And I was in it within two years. Don't wait until you are a pro to be a pro, right? Like, I like doing something, look, stopping and learning from it. Like, it just looked like it was a heavy hit. It gets up, it's not up. You know, that's the first time I played, like, professionally. I'm making rugby money. How can I make money outside of it? And those two Scottish guys, and I said, oh, you're, um, you're here for the movie. Rugby is a sport where that's often coupled with actually having a good time. He looked at me and he says, you guys are off. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another great episode of Grow Rugby. My name is Gift Gift Tommy Bailu, and this is a show where we speak to people about the opportunities that they have found, created, or taken advantage of via rugby. Man, what a heck of a weekend. We had the USA Rugby Club Sevens National Championships going on. And a big shout out to the Chicago Lions and Scion women for winning out the championships, being mentioned as the best teams in Rugby Sevens under USA Rugby's National Championship matrix style. Because there's like a dozen championships. We got Rugby Town about to come up just from now <laughs> recently. So, yeah, of course, of course, you know, we got to recognize all the did- tidbits. But, guys, yo, I want to say early on, on, please, guys, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this show. Uh, whether you're on YouTube, whether it's through podcasts, guys, it's just, it helps us to be able to push it around. We get to spread the message and we continue bringing on amazing people to be able to be on the show. And we have an amazing person coming on today. This man has been in the game for over 10 years. You know, he has been working it and it led him to the highest position in uh, Rugby Sevens right now. The highest competition in Rugby Sevens. Uh, He's an Olympian. He is a Life University champion. He is a Pacific Rugby uh, champion. premiership champion uh he is a military man he is a family man yo we got the great the awesome cody melfi on the show today olympian scrum half for usa rugby eagle let's go guys let's go man and this was a great conversation i mean we 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 really it was just very smooth. It was really great to be able to see the natural progression of what it takes to get to this position uh, in 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 as an athlete, as a rugby person, because I think sometimes there's so much confusion into what happens that we kind of underestimate how difficult and how much sacrifice and work is put to get to this position, to, to get, get to that highest level of rugby, that highest level. And, uh, you know, Cody was awesome, super down to earth, absolutely the nicest guy. And, of course, guys, if you guys didn't know, this is the, the, the TikTok king of USA Rugby next to Ilona, Ilona Marr, the TikTok queen of USA Rugby. And these two set the precedent going into the Olympics and coming out of it. So, oh, man, it was, it was really dope to talk to him. This is, there's so much in here. There's so much in here. Um, I, whew. But, guys, I also tell you, guys, check down below. We got some links for you. We got some great, great discounts. Rugby Outlet Mall, we're about to go out of our current shirts. We got the HBC Rugby for the Culture, as well as our uh, uh, iconography shirts, icona rugby shirts, (laughs) as we like to call them. Um, Please check it out. Um, And definitely, if you guys haven't gotten a chance to look back at some of our past episodes, last week, we had uh, Mick Feely before. We had uh, Maria Thomas of Trinidad and Tobago Rugby. And we got a really amazing depth of personalities, players, and personnel that we have going on. Uh, definitely check them out if you haven't had a chance. But definitely take a listen to this one. So I'm not going to hold you guys off any longer. The great, the legend, the awesome 
Cody Melfi. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another great episode of Grow Rugby. My name is Gift Gift Tommy Bailu, and we got a very, you know what? I don't know if VIP even works in the same way anymore. We're going, we got the O, the L, the Y, M P I A N, the man, Cody Melfi. Doing it big for the USA Rugby Eagles, getting his debut on the Olympic stage in Tokyo. Cody, man, thank you so much for coming through. Oh, thank you. I appreciate this so much. I just love jumping on these things and getting to share a little bit of our stories and kind of have a conversation. It's pretty cool. You know, that's it's one of the, I think, the most interesting components of it is being able to share the stories. Because ironically in rugby, it's always this weird little component where we're big enough where there's a lot of global reach, but it's small enough where everything is still like one-on-one, if that makes sense. It still feels yeah. very down to earth. So like in one instance, if it was like track and field and people are like, oh man, that's track and field people. You're way and above. I, I can't connect over here. But then you go rugby and it's like, oh, you guys do the same thing. But for some reason, I feel like I, I can talk. I don't feel, <laughs> it doesn't have the intimidation factor. And I think that's a big positive when it comes to being able to develop things in the larger capacity yeah no absolutely it it does feel like i can have more of a conversation with anybody i I mean i'm approachable so approach me (laughs) (laughs) come talk to me understand this and also obviously i i forgot to to mention uh uh, not only is the this man an olympian it's our second but second highest i guess no would be the highest at this point tiktok star all right, because Aki, Aki was up there first. But then we got oh, yeah. you now kicking in as the next level of the TikToks. So we're slowly re- moving hey. up, man. <laughs> hey, we just, I mean, we have fun. That's all we like to do. So we have fun. <laughs> no, look, it's, it, it, I always like to talk about where we meet people and even speaking to that or where we got to know people. And for you, I actually, ironically, I saw you a little bit at Life University because we had games that were over there uh, uh, whenever we were covering yeah. a lot of the women. But I think my biggest uh, intro to you actually ironically came because of your social media. And you were one of the first uh, elite rugby players that were actually using social media and, uh, and TikTok early. And even Instagram. And I know particularly it was Instagram first, but you came in early with, in, uh, with TikTok because yeah. I especially watch it for how people use social media. And you were dropping like... I, it was quick to 24K, basically, when I, I saw it. I was like, I think I saw you at like 150, and the next thing I saw, I was like 24K. I was like, this man really going. Show your yeah. life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's all I try to do is share my life and share the outside. You know, you got this rugby professional, but then you got all this stuff in the in the background that I like to do, and that's what TikTok came along and, and provided that, like, little avenue of just releasing who I was as a person to the to the community and to the public, which was cool. Man, you know, yeah. and, and it goes back to what we say, you know, it's authenticity that that changes the game and uh, that adds so much more depth into what it is that we do. So as you're able to keep digging into that, oh, my goodness, like, obviously, people get just more and more attached to that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, originally, when I like you said, I started on Instagram and it was just like this avenue of like, you know, trying to inspire, you know, a generation and inspire whoever I could. And then TikTok came along and I saw something from Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V. Gary V. And he was like, you got to jump on TikTok if you want to grow yourself as a person, as a businessman. As any. And like my wife showed me that video and she jumped on first and she was like 10,000 followers within like two weeks. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and same thing. I hopped on there, had a video go to like 4 million in the first week and like it was the growth from it was crazy. 15,000, 20,000 people following in, within a week. I was like, whoa, okay, here we go. Let's keep That's growing. This. Wild. Yeah. And it's, it's done really well now and it's awesome. Man, and that's that's exactly what it's supposed to be. But like, I, I even heard the same thing because Gary V. Not only did he push, I mean, he was heavy pushing. I remember it, it was literally, guys, get on TikTok, get on LinkedIn, get on TikTok, get on LinkedIn. I, I'm acting like he still yeah. is not saying that. Get on TikTok, get on LinkedIn. No, uh, I, that's why I downloaded LinkedIn too. <laughs> you say that like that is literally. <laughs> I downloaded TikTok and I downloaded LinkedIn because of that man. <laughs> no, uh, look. 
it, it, it's real. I, I know for me it was it's it's a little bit it was a little tougher because I came in whenever it was just musically initially, and yeah. I didn't really it didn't feel get a feel for it. Uh, but it's also like the test. Like it's, I feel like sometimes it's just you need the examples and then it, it kicks in. And now, now I'm trying to do it, which is, eh, yeah. You can always say it's late, but I've always been late to the game. I'm, I'm, I'm here to try and yeah. let me, let me see what we can do when we catch up. Let me see what happens here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Absolutely. So, so I always like to say, it's important to know the uh, origin story of every superhero. So, Cody. If you're ready for this question, how'd you get started in rugby? I love this question because so many people assume that because you're on the professional level, you got started so young. And like, and there's so many of us who got started on later days in our life. And I got started when I was 18, actually. So nice. I had this buddy, Jesus Flores, and he's actually, he was really well known in the rugby community before he passed. Um, but he was talking about rugby and just in the school hallway. And I was like, you know, I want to go out for this. I want to try it out. And he's making a team. And so the man, you know, got all the football players, all the track stars. You know, I, was, I came from soccer background and wrestling. And we just went out and we started crushing the season. And we had so much fun. Like we, we had two head coaches, Charlie Riley and Ethan Pugne, both. And Ethan's very well known in the, in the rugby world, too. And both of them just made the culture of rugby just so fun that nice. nobody wanted to give it up at that point. So um, I just kept playing. I actually went to college for soccer, <laughs> and I dropped out to continue playing rugby at Glendale. <laughs> and it just kind of grew from there. <laughs> so, Dude. Yeah, yeah. crazy. Dude, that's tight. Like, it, it, it's very interesting. I've always been a, a, a big it, – it's been an interesting observation that I've seen that whenever you people start getting play, – playing with playing rugby, once you get into the, the rhythm of the sport, it's very difficult for people to be like, I don't really care for this. I don't really like it. I like, But I like the key that you, you had put that um, your coach, uh, uh, Ethan, right? Yeah, Ethan and Charlie. Ethan and Charles, like that they had created an environment that was attractive that made the rugby that much more attractive on it. Like for that, for you, like what was it that they had were doing specifically that made it so engaging? So we had, so Ethan was some from South Africa. So he's just mm -hmm. like born around rugby. He knows everything about rugby. Of course. And we got blood. Jesus who had played like a year and a half. So he was like barely knew anything. He was a scrum half though. So he had to know a little bit more. And we had this guy, Charlie, who's just old, an older man, you know, played back in the 80s, you know, very old school. And the first practice we show up and he just like throws the ball out and he's like, all right, play. And we're just like, <laughs> and we're like, whoa, what? And he's like, like every time we do something wrong, he's like, no, you can only pass backwards. And we're like, okay, we can only pass backwards. And like, it's in Colorado. So it's like a little bit of snow on the ground. It's muddy. Right. And we're just out there tackling each other, like, and just having fun and, and then every practice kind of just entailed that. It was just like a whole lot of fun. We didn't know what we were doing. It was two people who knew what they were doing on the team. Everybody else was trying to figure it out. <laughs> hey, <laughs> learn by fire. Yeah. Yeah, and we, and we were just athletic. So, like, we were just right. some of the best athletic players at our school. And we were going out, we were just showing teams up 80 to zero, and we were just, like, pounding God, teams. Dog. Yeah. Yeah, we were just pounding teams, and that's what, uh, that's what made it fun, too. We were just like, okay, we're, we're good. It helps a little bit. It helps. Yeah. Oh, oh, we winning? Oh, we winning, winning. Oh, let's see how many wins we can really pull off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was like a power team. <laughs> Y'all were just cheat coding. This is the ultimate, like, mash button playing. It's just like, yeah. I don't know what's going on, but we just good. So just, just keep hitting this. It's like a bunch of seniors. We're 18 years old. We got two months of school left. We're graduating. Oh. We're just, you know, we're just, like, trying to let's have go. fun. <laughs> Yo, so you know you you you're going in that concept right but that you you're talking about that's the last coming at the tail end so for you you having a scholarship in soccer and you ended up going where for for soccer originally uh, so I went to Metro State uh in Colorado the D2 school in Denver so you're looking at that you're in, you you had to call everybody aimed for that a hey, we getting in and and having the the full partial whatever school is paying for me to be here in some way shape or form for you, yeah. what was it that made you go, you know what, 
I need to go back to rugby because this was something that was similar with Cheta Emba that I, I I saw, and I'm trying to understand this under under full factor. So yeah. for you, what was it that like was was inkling in the back of your head that was like, you know what, I need to get back to whooping up on people again. <laughs> yeah, sure. So originally, like my dad had me in like multi sport everything, and he's like, you're gonna become a pro baseball player. And like my freshman year, I quit baseball, and he was like, you just threw away millions. I was like, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to be a pro soccer player. Like, <laughs> my destiny, I will be a pro soccer player. So, like, D2 freshman Cody, like, most minutes on the team, you know, we go to the final four and, and nationals. Like, we do well. And I'm just, like, kind of in this groove. And there was just this falling out with, with soccer where it just kind of became the sport where I just didn't love it anymore. And mm. I had this experience with my coach that I got fouled in the box once. Mm-hmm. And I didn't go down. I kind of just I, – I took it, and, like, we didn't get the foul called. And he was like, you better go down the next time if you <laughs> put, like, that in the box. And I was like – it was, like, this, like, moment of reckoning. And then, like, we're, like, getting ready for the next season come around. I was like, I just don't think I can – I don't feel – I don't feel it anymore. So, I, you right. know, I had a conversation with the coach and told him, I was like, I'm done. Like, I, I just can't play this anymore. And, like, I at the time I was still – playing a little bit of rugby but not a lot and then i hit up ethan and actually ended up moving in with ethan um, no. a little bit older than me he's two years older than me so i i moved in with him and everything was rugby at that point like i just became like a rugby hoe pretty much i, I was playing every <laughs> team. I thought it up for rugby you know we just <laughs> i was playing on every team i was studying rugby we were watching like the world series every single tournament there was we'd nice. sit up to and play and then we had the rugby like world cup 15 on on yeah. xbox we always played like that was, game was dope all we that did game was awesome yeah and then we um, and then we started a rugby team like we started a high school rugby team so it was like I was coaching, I was playing, I was learning, I was watching, I was I was doing everything I could. It was and it just became like my life. Like rugby literally I, I went to work and then <laughs> rugby. <laughs> Yo, but I, I love that because it's, it it takes you through the ringer, takes you through the laundry of it. Like at that point now you're just absorbing it. Whenever they always say like you become your greatest whenever you become obsessed with trying to be great in something. You know, yeah. it's well, you know, obviously some people can be like, ah, no, you need to diversify. But no, in reality, it's just like I'm just diversifying how I'm learning. But it is in this one subject uh, particularly. Yeah. For you, you know, you, you mentioned how much of a multi-sport athlete. Is that something that was already indicative within your family that you guys were an athletic family? Or is it something that your dad was like, look, I see my boy. He's going to be an absolute professional athlete <laughs> starting with baseball. And then we'll see what goes from that. No, I, I, athletics has always been a part of the family. And my dad actually was a world-class trampolinist. Um, oh, he, he had a chance to go to the Olympics and I'm just missing out. So he was, he's actually really, you know, world renowned, um, Olymp- not Olympus, but trampolinist. Yeah. And so from like the age we were born, I, I was playing soccer at three, baseball, everything. I I played soccer, baseball, wrestling, basketball. I I golfed. I played tennis. I, you know, every single thing that they could, they could have me in. And I wanted it too. I was like, I was that one kid who was like, played video games and played sports. (laughs) That's it. That's all I wanted to do. I didn't care about school. I didn't care about about any of those stuff. I just want to play sports. I just want to play video games when I couldn't play sports. (laughs) It's real. Look, this is, this is, sometimes I tell people, I'm like, look, you know, there's always people who are like, oh, man, I wish I grew up in so-and-so different era. But in all honesty, I, for me, I'm just like, this this era that we're in right now where all these factors like video games and sports and, and, and tech stuff can be a prominent and financially beneficial, but mainly at least credibly acceptable uh, way of doing things as opposed to, Oh, you're playing so many video games? Yo, you're lazy. You're not doing anything with your life. Yeah. Yo, you know, <laughs> you're in sports? Ah, no, man. You're not ever going to be professional. You got to do it. Like, I love the fact that it, it, you basically were building yourself for this, this last 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> no, no, that's awesome. But do you feel like that, that, that family dynamic of athleticism? helped with how you were studying for rugby whenever you kind of jumped all the way in. Yeah, I mean, I was pretty much just diverged in every sport that I played growing up. So it was like, if you're going to play the sport, then you need to you need to practice. You need mm-hmm. to 
you need to show up to practice on time. You need to show up to games. You need to put in the extra hours, the extra minutes. Like, you know, I was always around the around the neighborhood playing with the, my friends and playing with people around the neighborhood, like had my soccer ball at my feet all the time. It was like one, just one of those things. So I really, I, you know, now that you bring it up, it probably was something that was like, okay, yeah, let's, we got to put our whole mind to it and we got to, we got to go for it. And that's, that's what I did. I just, I just loved it so much to be honest. It was easy to do. I just, it's all I wanted to do. I, I just loved it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. For you, then you know you, you you get this moment, and it's very rare, especially after college. Like, and, and and you know, bear with me, but you know, whenever you're you're in college, you're over at Metro State, and then you end up working in and and living with Ethan. In that process and time, like, did how, what was what was the family dynamic that went into it? Because I know for me, when I started playing rugby, and I started playing rugby after after college, uh, but I found out about it during it. My family was always really like iffy on it because nobody really knows much about this sport. Uh, and then, of course, if it's something that can be injurious or we're Nigerian, so if it's not immediately profitable, you know, it's like, well, what, what is it that you are doing? Like, what is wrong with you? You know, it's like, you, but you end up having to prove it over time for you because you already had this, uh, what a lot of people would consider the major goal of working in soccer and actually being in the collegiate uh, athletic uh, facility, how were your parents able to, how was your family taking it that you started moving into rugby? Yeah. So when I first started rugby, take it back just a little bit at 18, mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed to play football growing up. So that was the one sport like I didn't name that I played because it was, my dad didn't want me playing that. He, he taught first aid concussion classes growing up. And uh, he was early to the game on CTE. Yeah, so he was like, he he was like, you know, you can't you can't play this, you can't play football. It's the only sport you can't play. So I turned eighteen and I joined rugby, and I came home and told my dad, "Hey, <laughs> I got a game this weekend, Dad." <laughs> He's like, a, "A game?" I said, "Yeah, a rugby game." He goes, "What the?" And I, I was like, "Yeah, just come." And he showed up, and you know, I scored. I, I don't know how many tries I scored. I scored a bunch of tries, and after Let's the game, go. After Let's that. go. Don't be humble about it, Cody. Let him know. I scored 16 tries in the game. <laughs> you know, I my dad. <laughs> he came up to me after that. He's like, I should have had you in football this whole time. <laughs> and he was just, he was so about it. So, like, moving on, he like they've always been, like, a big support about that. So, nice. you know, when, when I kind of turned down, like, I had worked so hard for this, like, freshman, you know, soccer, you know, what I was doing at Metro said, I worked so hard for that. Right. And when I stopped playing soccer, and then I, I did another year of school before I dropped out of school, mm -hmm. and it was a very strict, like, you need to, you know, my parents were like, you need to be going to school, you need to get your education, you need to, right. you know, it was like, they, they were still supported me because I was playing semi-pro at Glendale, and they mm -hmm. understood, like, what rugby was, but, you know, it was that, like, you know, this isn't going to take you anywhere. You need you need this education. You need to you need to focus on like getting a real job. You need to you know set your set your future up. You know buy a house, like settle down, those type of things. And it was a huge conversation. And you know, so slowly I started getting like onto better and better teams and more recognition and stuff like that. And like the support has always still been there. Like they were they come to my games. They'd still support right. me. They'd love watching me. They cheer me on all that stuff. But there's still that like background like. You know, like, you know, how are you going to support yourself? So, you know, I'm working a full-time job right. playing rugby at night, you know, so that's how I support myself. And then I get to do what I want to do. And it, it was this like, you know, you, you need to go back to school. You need to, you know, do these little things that, that, it, and it was always chirping, you know? And, and so when the life university opportunity came around, that was just amazing. And it just kind of fell, it fell into place and, and they were ecstatic about it. And, you know, I got to explain to them, it's like one of the top, top rugby school <laughs> and I get some education and I were ecstatic about it. So like that kind of just falling into place kind of put everything at ease and, and then just became this like momentum shift of like me moving into like where I needed to go and what, and what got me here. Yo, so, everything, everything works in its own reason, yeah. you know, it's the, the but I, it, it's that slow steady step up. And I, I think sometimes it gets lost in the factor of how much it's a, of a process it is to get to those 
levels where it makes sense to the masses and all you have is just yourself to in better or worse you have yourself in your own self-motivation that has to be able to keep carrying you forward over and over and over again yeah you know dude yeah. i love that i've had I good support it. all the way uh, along the way too because i mean my wife now who i met when i was 19 like she's always pushed me into all these opportunities and like life university was something i didn't know if i was going to take or not and she was like you gotta go and like oh, it's so always like that support system behind that has really pushed me into like kind of becoming the person I am now. And like you said, the trusting the process and like you don't really know the process. You never know like all of us athletes on this team, like we all have different stories. We all have different processes. And all you guys see and what the fans see is us running out on the field and performing. <laughs> and you, know, like, you don't see anything, like to be honest, like there's so much like and I'm I'm always telling you one percent of one percent, you know. Oh, oh, we we gotta get we're gonna pull into we're gonna try and get at least fifteen percent before this <laughs> is over. But no, no, but I, I think that's real. Like I I was talking to Sarah Saul about it, and it's another it was an aspect that she always talked about a lot in the factor of like, hey, I I've seen what they do behind the scenes. Like, I know the work that goes in. So as much as everybody is, you know, being critical, and of course, criticism and fandom, they go hand in hand, you know? So you it, it's part of the spectation of the sport, but it's like, I know what the things that people are critical of are often critical out of sheer ignorance because a lot of what you guys think is going on doesn't really exist. And what you don't realize is happening is probably the heaviest components of it that's going through, whether it's the, the, the personal battles, the mental battles, financial battles, social battles, yeah. you know, it, it it's All a those. lot of things that go in, you know, and look, even, even doing this media stuff has allowed me to step back a lot more behind the scenes in a lot of aspects where you become a little bit more empathetic to to what's going on because you have to because now you understand the process and you're just like guys like one it's it's probably not as nefarious as you guys believe it to be and it's yeah. also not as noble as you guys believe it to be it's it's ironically very very difficultly simple like it, it's a weird it's it's a, it's a paradox you know yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely i agree with that <laughs> you know so you know you you you've had the chance to be able to play on these levels. Add to that your militariness. So, mm. whenever you were going between between living with Ethan, starting to play for Glendale, and then Life University, right? You joined the military in that. No, no, you joined the military after Life University, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Back. So, in the time whenever you were there, at what point in time did you start to feel like, yo, this? I get this sport. Like I get it on the field. I don't just love it. I get it uh, from a field yeah. perspective. Well, with all the time that I spent with Ethan, like, to be honest, I just like, I asked him question after question after question. Like I was the question guy and, and then I get around even more experienced people. And I, I was question guy like Andre Snyman, you know, famous Springbok. Like I asked that dude every single question I could when he was my coach, you know, and, you know, breakdown rules, like uh, law book stuff. I was like, well, can't we just like, I know the rule says this, but couldn't we do this to get around the rule? And like, I was like trying to break everything down. And so it really kind of just it, it was a slow process to that realization that I, I did have what it what it took. And I always wanted it was you always want something, you know, you always like dream of something like since 2012. I've dreamed of being on this team. Like I wanted to be on this team. I have like said I'm going to be on this team. But, you know, you don't really understand how you're going to get there and, until right. you start doing it and you start getting on along with that process. And so the realization that like. I was, you know, capable. It was probably my senior year at, at life. I was just like, you know, I, I was comfortable. I, I knew that I was good. We were going to a season where, like, you know, we have a good team too. And it was just like I had a good, good players and good support system around I'm sorry. Me. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Did you just say that you had a season where you guys were good? I'm sorry, Cody. Can you tell me the season that you guys weren't good? I would like to look at this in the, in the books. Well, you know, no matter how good you are, like this is like this could be like the All Blacks could probably say this to you too. No matter how good you are or think you are, like you still have that like that pressure that you're like, okay, we need to go show how good we are now. Like we True. need to go prove how good we are. Like, 
we have all the pressure on us, you know. These schools that are coming to play us that have never beat us before have no pressure. It's us to go show that, like, we are the best and right. to show them why we're the best. And so, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all that is. Like, you know, you know, life is one of the best schools and I'll always back life. Life is, life is you know, my baby. <laughs> hey, yo, respect. Hey, look, yeah. I, I, I've, I've, I am I am not a big fan of the city of Atlanta, but life you Marietta and a lot of aspects of Atlanta has has been very beneficial in the development of my my rugby career, my rugby media career in a lot of instances. Life University, very specifically, shout out to to Roslyn specifically on, on yeah. that Roslyn shout because she's, yeah, yeah, she's awesome. very key. Um, but you know, I, I I remember even actually I think this was a game. I think whenever you guys were playing uh, Lindenwood, I'm I'm literally jumping for it because I just know this one because yeah, I had it on film. But at, at one of the millions times, I think this was like 2016, and you guys had uh, it was it was when you guys did that wildly crazy um, dummy off uh, underneath the Harley Wheeler. I, I, I that was yeah, you were there that yeah. year. That was 2016. That was your last year. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you guys ended up beating, I think, Lindenwood by – it wasn't by very much. It was a close game. It was actually a really entertaining game. But I always remember that, one, because I was trying to do a halftime show at that point. So, like, I was trying to do stuff there. But it always just showed the dynamic of, like, the creativity that Life University constantly had in their in their training. And that yeah. leads me to my next question. You, you know, you, you got to lead it right. That's a journalistic way. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, you had this epic training with Glendale, and Glendale has been known for being WPL, D1, the semi-pro back in the day. Like, it's a, it's, yeah. it's a training hub, all right, yeah. for, 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 for Eagles and then some. And then you go to Life University. For you, what was it that – did you see a difference in the type of training, or did you feel like there was one that you – could feel like, that you felt a little bit more um, attached to that helped you in your development? Yeah, so at Glendale, it's a men's program, and I was a 19-year-old boy. Right. And so <laughs> you know, I was trying to find eagles. Like, world, I had eagles everywhere in front of me. Like, the whole starting lineup at Glendale was eagles, you know? And, and the positions I – wanted to play or was, you know, could have been best in or fly half, you know, behind Nesse and Atta Malifa, you know? And, right. And so it was like so many Eagles across the board. So I was in the like very like back burner, like wing fullback position where like maybe a center position here or there. And I was, I was training around all these men. So I was like, you know, I was becoming this man who was like, you know, backs and forwards when you're tackling sessions, like you're in that. Yeah. Like, you're putting your head in and, and that, you know, I, so I got this, like, like this badass, like I'm putting my head into anything. I can tackle anybody. I was like, you know, I'm going to run through this wall, baby. You guys yeah. can't do nothing to me. Yeah, pretty much. I just had to, I had to become this guy who was like not afraid of nothing. And so like, that was the big jump there. And then when I got to life, it became more of like, I could hone in on my skills and what I was mm. good at and what I wanted to, what I, what I could bring to the team from a bigger perspective and then kind of just like I was in a full-time environment at life too. So, you know, right. you go to school, you play rugby and you're playing rugby multiple times a day. And then outside of that, you know, we're, we're all rugby bros, you know, hanging out at the dorms and stuff like we're, right. we're playing rugby some more too. Like that's all we wanted to do. So that full-time environment is like, it's definitely key in development is any type of full-time uh, environment because a men's level you kind of just do two or three nights a week maybe four that full-time environment really kind of changes things to be honest like did it because did, i mean you even though with glendale it was it was a part-time on field but i mean if you're you're having these huge study sessions on a daily outside of work and and then field yeah. play i mean how how different is that from what you guys would already be doing at life um so it was just more specific at life. Like, you, you yeah. know, we we're, were studying more of our, ourselves and more of the teams we were playing where at Glendale is more like a broader, like I'm studying rugby. Right. And I, I mean, even at Glendale, to be honest, like it wasn't the only team I played on at Glendale. Like I was playing for, for Queen City. I mean, we had Wednesday night sevens um, during the summer and mm -hmm. I was playing for Littleton. There were so many teams that every, those nights you're like supposed to get three or four games and me and Jesus would get in like eight or nine games. 
Oh, nice. just like popping on <laughs> any team that needed somebody was just popping in. Like those were the so it like it was it kind of was a full time environment, but because I made it that like you Monday, Wednesday, it. Friday was Glendale practice, Tuesday, Thursday was Queen City, and then I coached four days in between. It was like you know, nice. I was like. It was a full time environment in itself, but it wasn't like I couldn't just focus on it. It wasn't the only thing I was doing. I, you know, I had a lot of other stuff going on, like especially like work. You know, logistically not full. Logistically, logistically unfull, but uh, yeah. uh, spiritually very full. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. We we gotta put some brands to it. All right, we're changing the game out here, Cody. <laughs> 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 oh, but you know, I I love that factor, and and especially what again, as people understand this process of of lifting, and you know, the criticism is always going to be has always been, oh man, how are we developing as uh, as a country and rugby and how we move up? It's like, hey guys, what is it that you're willing to invest inside of it? And I, it's been one aspect that's been interesting for me. So. This is, I'm going to kind of skip forward because I could literally break this down incrementally, but I, I want to really get to the biggest meats and potatoes of this. Yeah. And once you get into this international level. So for you, you get out from Life University. All right. You, you've built up your name over at Life. It's, it's almost impossible not to have developed some level of a name. And you were a pretty dominant player during that time, 15s and 7s uh, at Life. So whenever you graduated, did, they, did, uh, did the Eagles immediately try and come pick you up? And say like, hey, Cody, come here. Let's go to the Olympic training environment. Or was there a process? Because, again, you you joined the military in between there. And I'll ask about that a little bit. But you joined the military in between. So what what was that process of you getting from graduate and obsessive student to now becoming a obsessive high-performance student? (laughs) Yeah. So there there was no approach. Um, while I was at college. So I did go to U23 15s camp and then went to Australia, played three games. And I did get approached from them about playing 15s. And they, and I was like, oh, I just kind of love sevens. And like, look, you, you have a future in 15s. And that's kind of what they told me. Yeah. But sevens was kind of the, the, the thing that I love. And then you have the pin mutual, the CRCs, which is like the last thing you do as a college player. Right. And so like that led me right into summer sevens with, uh, um, with the Denver Barbarians. And so at this time, I hadn't been approached about anything. I didn't know anything. And so we went, played the whole summer men's nationals. We went on to, we lost at the final play of the match um, when uh, we kicked the ball away and it just didn't go our way. You know, we got scored on. And oh, man. And it, it hurts. I like, I can, I can feel the pain in your eye on that because it's like, it's like, God. If we had just kept it, all we need to do is just keep it. I, does that play in your mind sometimes where you're just like, guys, just just, just, just hold on to it? I think it's more so just like that feeling of you could have had something that you didn't have. Yeah. It's not really like one player or another. It's just like of that course. feeling of like you could have you had that champion. That the championship have. was sitting there right in your eyes, and it just yeah. felt like it just made it right out of reach. I, the, I totally the worst part it. about it was like our coaches had been there like 10 or 11 times have been in finals and never won it. And so we're like, we oh. are going to win this for our coaches. Like we were so pumped about it and like we were there, you know, and then to kind of get all the way there and not win it again was that like big letdown. And like, you could yeah. just feel the hurt and everybody. And like, there's some players there too. Like I had just joined the team. So, you know, it's a little bit different for me, but for some people, five or six year veterans on the team, you know, yeah. and you know, Maximo, Maximo de Archival, you know, he's like, <laughs> He's like been there for nine years, like hasn't oh. won a championship yet. And you're like, dang, man, you just wish for like you could have finished the game. You wanted and that so, movie. You wanted that cinematic finish. It, it yeah. was cinematic finish, and you ended up getting Friday Night Lights. You yeah, didn't, you were, <laughs> yeah, we got we we didn't get the cinematic finish. You know, Kansas City did. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. does that hurt a little bit more because it's an internal like rival within your division as well, too? I think, I, I don't think it really didn't hurt as much because we, us, Kansas City and Utah were in the final four yeah. and we we're like three, three teams from our division or like our conference were in the final four. Like that's pretty awesome for our conference. Right. And that just shows how good we are. And um, so it, personally for me, it didn't hurt maybe for other guys because we <laughs> played Kansas City like 
12 times a summer. <laughs> you, know, you know what's funny? I, I, look, I call that the Southeastern rugby, the Southeastern uh, conference mentality. Look, if it's not me, at least let it be the people that we played against. Let one of us at least win. I prefer one, let uh, others, and then everybody outside of this, you guys can go screw yourselves, all right? But yeah. keep it in division. Keep it. Yeah. In That's kind of how it felt, to, to be honest, for me. So, anyways, so that tournament ended, mm-hmm. and we're in, the, we're in the airport. And, you know, I'm chilling with Kayvon and some of the other guys on the team. Nice. And, yeah. you know, Kayvon's on Twitter, which I don't have a Twitter. I, I still don't have a Twitter. I didn't have one at the time. And, you know, he's like, oh, Mike Friday just tweeted you because Mike Friday was there. And, Right. And I was like, ah, shut up. And he's like, no, he just tweeted and he like read the tweet. He's like, man of the tournament, in my opinion, Cody Melfi. And and nice. I was like, dude, shut the hell up. Like, get <laughs> out of here. Like, and I like didn't believe him. And he's like, no, look. And he showed me it. And I'm like, I and like I knew who Mike Friday was. I was like, yes. Yeah. So like, so I was like, at this point, I'm like, holy cow. So I'm like, call my wife. I'm like, Peyton, Mike Friday just shouted me out, man. Like he said I was the man of the tournament man. and like, it, like call my mom. And I was like, this is amazing. Like I just couldn't believe it. And you know, from that moment, the next tournament, two weeks later is Sarevi rugby town. And like, right. I still hadn't heard anything from Mike. And so at rugby town, Chris Brown, who is the women's coach head coach, but he was our assistant head coach back then. He nice. was at rugby town. You really and, only work with the best, don't you? Like you, yeah. you have had a, a legit pleasure of being able to work with it. That is a blessing in the fullest. It, it is. It absolutely is. I'm surrounded. Like that's what I'm saying. That full time environment. Like being out here in a full time environment for the last four years has made me a better player than I could have ever imagined being on like a men's team or like doing it on my own. Like nice. it's just, it has been a blessing. So we go into this rugby town, for every rugby town, and same thing. I just had a not you know killer tournament. Same thing and. Uh, you know, Brownie's like, you know, man of the tournament, Cody Melfi. And I'm like, whoa, like what the, like what's going on? So like back to back man of the tournaments at like between the head coach and the assistant coach. And Brownie, I guess, was my spokesperson because he got me out to an incubation camp, which when I first got invited, I was like, sweet, I'm going to be with all the, all the, you know, all the guys I've been looking up to for six years. You know, I'm going right. to be with Maka Nufe, Falau Niwa, you know, Perry Baker, I can't wait, Ben Pinkelman. And I was like, this is going to be absolutely amazing. And I get to the, this incubation camp, and it's a crossover athlete camp. Oh, and, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so, like, we were there, like, Joe Schroeder was there, and he was a cheerleader, yeah. like, you know, and, like, we had track stars, and we had, like, football stars, and we, like, it was, a, it was just a crossover. Like, it ended up being a camp for, like, crossover athletes that they were trying to, like, find athletes. And I was like – and it was just me, Chris Matina, um, Fatala Talapusi, I think, and then, like, nice. maybe one other that were rugby I mean, players. Clearly, you guys still <laughs> – clearly still made it up to the next level. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no, absolutely. The rugby players uh, that were there, we were like, okay, like, you know, what is going on? Like, it – like balls getting dropped every pass, like like right. people not knowing how to pass. Like we were doing passing drills, like, and I was just like, whoa! Like I really thought I was coming into like a USA Rugby camp. Like I really mm-hmm. believed I was, and you know, um, and and we weren't. And you know, I'm judging, like I'm judging Joe. I'm like, he's a cheerleader. <laughs> oh, <I can't. laughs> I'm like, we got to we got to. Ch- I'm playing. I'm at my first USA Rugby camp, and I'm with, playing with a cheerleader, man. Like. <laughs> <laughs> and like you know, soon you find out like he he's amazing I mean, player. Hey, okay, you say playing with a cheerleader, but we forget the fact it's a six foot eight, six foot nine cheerleader over here. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> it, that didn't matter to me. I was like, he's a, he's a cheerleader. Like I didn't know his background. I didn't know who he was. I no, know. I thought he, I thought he never played rugby before. <laughs> oh my god, yo, that's too funny. But you know what? That it, it makes it so kind of like um, epically beautiful because it's like in 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 it's finding the finding the warriors through battle, and it's just like wait, I I, I thought I'm already in the top warrior. Who are you guys? But then you end up finding like oh, we got a lot more in common going on here. Yeah. Like this actually yeah. ends up working, but. Yeah, yeah so but you're seeing. Yeah. We had this. We had this track star too, who was out there, and he's faster than uh, Carlin Isles. And we're like, wow. hey, okay, let's go." He's out the whole time we're there. He's out with a hamstring, you know, hamstring injury. And the, the man- ender of like all speedster, I swear, yeah. the hamstring is limited. <laughs> yeah, and 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 then he couldn't even pass. He didn't know anything about rugby. Like he didn't know you had to pass the ball backwards. Like there's offside line, any of that. So we're like, right. okay, you know, like so. But 
they chose, you know, their favorite players, which like, I know like me, Joe, Chris, Tala. Um, I don't remember who else was there. I think there was a few mm-hmm. more that I got invited two weeks later to another camp. Okay. And this was a real camp. And this is where, you know, we were in with boys. We were, we were in with the big boys and we we're out there and I'm like, I'm sweating bullets, you know, like mm-hmm. you, you don't know how it feels like until you do this, I, I promise you don't know how it feels when you are the fresh meat on <laughs> and you're walking in there and you see all these pros and all these guys who you've looked up to and, and you're you're in the same training grounds as them. Like you're you're about to go compete against them, you know, and play like, and practice with them. Was it one of those situations where you almost get like a little bit of that imposter syndrome? Because at that moment, for whatever it's worth, at a certain level you guys are no longer it's no longer the guys above you, but at some level, you guys are equitable, you know, even yeah. though it's a camp, but you guys are on the same level. This is one on one. I prove yourself, et cetera. Like, yeah. So, that, I, you know. so what, what I was going to say is that you feel, you feel this seniority and you feel yeah. this, like you feel this, um, you know, they are the bees, you know, Danny Barrett, you know, you know, when you walk into, into a, a practice with him, he's, you know, he's all there. He's going to crush you if he has a chance to crush you. And so like, right. you, you have this feeling of like, wow, okay, I did make it, but there still is that little bit of like, okay, these are the guys, like, let me try to learn everything I can from these guys. Let right. me try to do what I can to help these guys, support these guys and prove myself to these guys that I belong here. Right. But yeah, the nerves and the like walking that first week was crazy. I, oh, yeah, I can't even explain the feeling of that. Dude, like I, I can only imagine only because of the it's like it, it's it's it feels like it's multi-tiered. It's one knowing that you are now in that that air arena, of course, that there's always that feeling. Two, knowing who they are. And then I feel like the third one that really has to hit is trying not to be a fanboy because okay. you know them so you you know them so well because you've watched them and you've seen this development over time. But you also have to try and make sure that you're res- being – you want to be respected and also respecting as a teammate. So it's not like, oh, my God, Danny, oh, my God, Perry, what the heck? Ah! You're yeah. just like, yeah, yeah, no, it's cool. Like, yeah, yeah we, we, we out here. You know, we're trying. We're trying to do some good rugby. It's it's fun. Yeah. And in your mind, you're just like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was me the whole time. I mean, I've been a fanboy since I, in 2012. I watched every single seven series. I went to every single Las Vegas no. seven tournament. I was like – but you know you are out there, and you and they are. They're just another player. Like at, at the point mm-hmm. where you when you get out there, they're another player. Beyond that, like outside of the field, like when, when I went on my first tour, I was a fanboy. I was like, oh, Marco, like let's get a picture. Like I'm trying to get like, <laughs> like man, let's, like, you know, I'm just playing with Danny Barrett my first tour. Like I was like, whoa, like you know. But like, when you're at that, when you get to that level, you kind of become this like you you are an equal in in every right. aspect of the game. Like no matter how good someone is, you. You have to see everybody on the team as an equal. So at the end of this camp is when I finally kind of got – I got pulled into the office at the end of the camp, and they were like, hey, you know, this is what we can offer you. And they, they offer me residency and a certain amount of money. And for me at the time, you know, I was engaged, and, you know, I was living in Colorado. And, you know, I was like, hey, can you have housing for my wife? And I'm like, no, she can't come along. So, like, all the decisions from – you know, that I could make in that, in that moment was like, you know, no, you can't take this opportunity, which was kind of this like crazy thing. I was like, you know, telling myself I can't take the opportunity. And I, and I told them that I was like, look, I just can't do this. Like, this is just like the amount of money that you're offering me in housing. Like I already did school for the last two and a half years away from, away from my girlfriend. Like I can't do that again to her, um, which I, I have a great relationship with. It was like all these decisions that you know, went up to that. And so what they offered me is to fly me in for camps. Nice. And that's kind of where it was. And like, you know, we're going to have you as this remote player who will fly in for camps. If you do well enough, we'll take you on tour type. And I was like, okay, cool. I can do that. And so that, so was, it, that was my first welcome into the team. Nice. You know, you, you talked about, um, and talked about how much of a development it was for you to, once you got into the elite camp and in terms of how you grew as a player, especially under the full time of sort, you know, there's been a lot said about how tough Mike Friday's camps are in terms of conditioning and strength training. Um, Can you kind of 
kind of talk a little bit about what it is that you guys would do? Because I always sometimes wonder why there isn't some replication at lo- other lower levels um, underneath yeah, so it. So it's, it's effective. The way that I look at it is it's so hard for these men's teams to replicate the training regimen that we do on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. You know, we're in the morning in the gym, we're doing two training sessions a day. You know, we got recovery and we're doing this every single day. And like when high performance camps come around, which is the camp before we go on tour, you know, we're doing that for six days. And then our our training sessions become an hour and a half instead of an hour. We're going from like 7 a.m. till 5, 6, 30 p.m. Like some of our days are like we're ending at 7 p.m. I'm getting home because we did like two and a half hours of film after our day was over. Like It's this full time environment that we're trained on. So like all the athletes that are in the who full time athletes, like our bodies are trained on this. Like we've we've we're used to it. We're used mm-hmm. to the Friday fitness that we got going on. We're, we're so used to everything. And then it, it gets ramped up even more in the HP camp because they're trying to, like, one, you know, figure you out and, like, trying to see if you're, if you're good enough and you're willing enough to go that extra mile. And, and two, just to push you beyond your limits. And so it gets ramped up even more. So when you find these, you know, athletes in and people are coming in, you know, four or five athletes, it's hard for them to, one, get into a regular training week two for that high performance week where it's everything's ramped up. And so I think Mm -hmm. that's why you kind of get this perspective of like, it's so hard, which it is. It's like, you know, there's days that we are crawling off the field and we're like, why, you know, if I didn't love this sport, (laughs) (laughs) why am I dealing with it like this? Right. Right. This is, this is life for me. My body, like our bodies in like 15 years will not be working like they are now. Like, we didn't love the sport as much as we do, and we're like so like gifted with the ability to go represent Team USA on like a, oh, a, yeah. a larger scale. Like we couldn't we couldn't sustain something like this. Like so, I think that's where kind of that vision about that or that you know that wording of like it's so hard because it is, but it, yeah. it, it's so much harder when you're, you're this athlete that hasn't been training. Like of course everybody's doing their gym, everybody's doing their training sessions, you know, but it's just not the same. It's just not. Right. The, it's not what we're doing. You know? it's, it, again, it's the reason you're pushing a different level because of the fact that now you've raised the body and the standards and the requirements to this next level. And I, once you've set that standard, then you're just working within the range of that as opposed to starting back like, oh, we went back down to a club and we got to go back all the way up to here. And that that recover that uh, recharge back up is where the difficulty truly comes out of. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And that, that's kind of the key difference. So, all right. So, kind of, kind of starting to close this a little bit. You know, want to go into to the Olympics because I, I could talk to you all day on this, and I got mad questions. But I'm, I'm, I'm gonna give you some freedom. But you going into Tokyo, you know, you you had a, went in with a very unique situation. Obviously, uh, it went in initially as an alternative, came off with Ben Pinkelman's injury, and you got kind of pushed into into the roster for you. In that moment, not even let's let's kind of back it up. What was it? What was the 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 feeling and process like just getting selected as an alternative? So I actually wasn't selected as an alternative. So, oh, okay. So yeah, okay. So I didn't make anything on the team alternate or anything. I wasn't on the. I, I was selected, not selected. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So so in that feeling there. So yeah. you you've done all the high performance. You did the training. And you don't make the final 12, 14, if you may, mm-hmm. onto that. What was that feeling like in, in that moment? Because that's four years of your time that you've been working into this. Yeah, it, it, for me, it was four. For some of the other guys, it's been five since 2016. Um, right. It was a lot of, like, at first, it was, like, just sadness. You know, it was like, holy cow, like, you know, I worked so hard for this. I really thought I was in a good position. Like, I think that I could have given to the team, you know, I felt like, you know, I could have been a player that, that helped the team and that could have, you know, pushed us into those metal rounds. And, the, and then it's like a little bit of anger, like, you know, comes in the next day and you're like, dang, you know, like, I can't believe I didn't get selected. And then it's this like, just this realization that, you know what, you're, you're a little bit younger. You've got more years ahead of you now is your time to support the team and make sure that this team that did get selected because they got selected for a reason, you know, you didn't get selected for a reason. 
you need to support these guys and make sure that they do go win that gold and kind of be be that player. And I, I kind of took a step back on that like second, third day because we had a week and a half off after selections. Like they right. knew, oh wow, they knew we needed time off. Right. So I mean, there's a lot of emotions and physical exhaustion that has to just come out from from that yeah. knowledge yeah. or not. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just like, took the step back. I was like, you know, what would I want if I was those players? Right. And I was like, I would want someone who, who came in with energy, who, who was positive, who supported us, who, who was pushing us and believed in us. And so I was like, you know what, that's what I have to do. And that's what I need to bring to training. And, and that's where, that's where I was, you know, that I got over everything else. And, and a lot of me didn't want to train, you know, I was like, I don't want to, you know, screw this i'm done like i'm done for the summer like i'm on break but then like once those emotions and everything came around like i wouldn't want somebody to do that either so like you know got back into training and i started training even harder because i was like you know what 2024 is going to be my year and i'm going to be one of the more senior guys and i'm going to lead this team you know i'm going to be the i'm going to be one of those main guys who can bring this team to olympic you know finals you know in 2024 so that's where it all turned into that at that moment did you have a conversation with your dad on that? Because like you, you talked about earlier, like with his trampolining, how close he was to being able to make the Olympics and kind of having a little bit of that parallel uh, yeah, with that. So did you I, have with that? Bit, uh, I didn't have any conversation specific like that, but I did have mm-hmm. conversations with all my loved ones, you know, close friends. I was like, hey, you know, like I didn't make it, but, you know, that's OK. And, you know, a little some tears were, were dropped, but, you know, um, it's real. It was just, yeah, it, it was. This is sports. It's the one place yeah. where the tears really can go without the judgment, if you know, whatever people yeah. want to say on that one. But so I yeah. had all those conversations, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, people don't know what to say. Like, that's the thing. Like, True. I don't, I didn't know what to want. I wanted to hear. I just had to let them know that it was going to be okay. <laughs> right. It's right. also not exactly the most relatable, uh, you know, uh, uh, feeling. Hey, guys, you know, I unfortunately wasn't able to be considered for the greatest sporting event in the yeah. history of the world. Yeah. You know, can you guys give me how you feel in, in your yeah. similar situation? Like, it, you don't have that, but it's dope that you got at least have the sounding board to be able to to be able to at least bounce it off. Yeah, yeah, and that's kind of how it came to at that, at that point. And um, I, I was good, you know, I was you know, you always have that deep down inside where you're like, dang, I just wish I was going. But like when we got back to training that next week and lifts and everything, I was good. I was ready to go. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to be the number one fan for this 15 guys who are going on to Tokyo. I'm going to be the number one guy there. So, yo, that's awesome. So obviously you start (laughs) to get the change and, um, you know, we hear, unfortunately, Ben Pinkelman, his finger, uh, and, uh, you know, it's now he's unable to make it onto the roster. Um, and yeah. you it get the call. Back. It was it his back. Ba- oh, I thought it was his finger. Like, I thought it was a yo, I'm telling you, reports do not come out accurately. So, yeah, you know, so he hurt his back actually quite a while ago. Um, and so he's oh, been, so it was a re injury. Yeah, no, he's he's already had one back surgery. He, he re hurt his back and, um, he hadn't been training. Um, and he played him, he played in one of the games for a quest for gold. And, yeah. He's one of the best players on our team. Like he's yeah, he is, he's, he's a senior player. Like he's been amazing for almost he, half a decade now. Yeah, and he changes the dynamic of games and everything. So he played in one of the games, the Quest for Gold, and um, he was getting some shots for like pain killing and stuff like that. Right. To, you know, so he could push on to the Olympics, and so that's so he got selected just be you know for that reason. You know, he, right. we needed him in the squad, and you know he came back and after getting those shots, they just didn't work, and he you know, brought the team together and he himself pulled out and said, you know, I just can't do this. Like, I'm just not, like he, you know, told us That's how he's feeling and everything. It just wasn't fit to play. And so, That's tough. Um, and I didn't even know that I was going to, oh, he's a forward, you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm a halfback. Yeah, you're a halfback you know? yeah. You, you, when you're seeing that, all, all I'm doing is feeling, you know, sadness for him because I have the same feeling. I didn't make the team and I'm like, oh man, I feel so bad. You know, you did make the team. You can't play. Right. You know? So, and, and and then you're thinking like okay you know it's not my position you know Ford's going in there you know so uh, like zero percent of me thought that I was the man who was coming into the squad at that point and so I wasn't even thinking about that I was just trying to support him and, and you know his feelings and make him feel a little bit better. That's real and that's good because I you know it's your team again it goes back to it's your teammate like yeah. you you've been rocking with him that's your guy yeah. a lot of people that, which is I, I mean I, I don't know because we, we've all played multiple sports and we know within the locker room it's our guys and stuff like that but I, I also recognize that 
something about rugby, even though there's competition for position, I think the – and I hate using this word because it's so cliche – but the camaraderie that <laughs> gets played in becomes so heavily important that you have the moment where it's like, yo, your dude got hurt, and it's not, oh, man, maybe I got a shot. Yeah. It's, yo, yo, are you good? Did you, did you end up trying to give him a call or anything like that, hit him up uh, whenever you so, found out about uh, the back pain injury? Well, he, he had been having this injury for a while, so we kind of all knew that, you know, he was fighting, like, if he could go or not. Yeah. Uh, and then when he announced, you know, I took time, you know, outside of rugby and um, out on the field and, like, talked to him and, like, you know, felt him out about that stuff and talked to him a lot. And, like, like you said, I mean, we're all boys. Like, and we know, like, you know you're in a professional environment. Every single one of us know that. Everybody who's out there, we all know we're in a professional environment. We all know that we're competing against each other. We all know that when HP camp comes that only 12 are going to get selected and there's right. 25 of us. Like, we know those things. But, you know, you can't have this, like, competitive side about like oh i can only make myself better and not the team because you'll never work you'll never be good as a team and you'll never get selected to be honest if you come in there thinking that you're the best and you're you're the only one who matters yeah you everybody's out there helping each other you know if somebody needs extra work well you know there's two or three guys jumping and like being like okay what do you need help with like let's do it like and that's just kind of the environment that we that we live in that's beautiful and that's what you're doing i mean that's the best that you can be able to train in so you know, what was that conversation like when you did get the call? Because now it's it's ring ring. Hey, Cody, what 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 was that? What what was yeah. that conversation? What was that 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 feeling? So I had I had put off my one on one with Mike for a bit because um, I just wasn't feeling like talking to him about like the decisions. And is, I, it, some, is it something that you guys do like a closing kind yeah, of kinda yeah. like because we got an email about the team selected. So like, you know, you want to go talk to Mike and see, you know, what his thought process was. And like, you know, I just didn't need it. Like I had the closure I needed, like, to be honest. And like, for me, like I understood, like, I was just like, I understand, like, you know, I'm not the guy these guys are, you know, like I'm okay with that. And like, I didn't feel like I needed that conversation. So I ended up, you know, he came spotted me and was like, after like a Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday practice, um, from when we got back, he's like, Hey, you going to talk to me or not? And I was like, yeah, let's talk. And so we like, you know, had our little conversation and kind of explained, you know, his, uh, statistics about strategy and, you know, why he did things. And, you know, he kind of explained to me that he said, you know, with Ben coming out, it kind of changes our strategy a little bit and we can bring in an extra player. And he said, and at the Olympics, our 13th player can play any game he wants. He's like, it's not a regular 13th player. You don't just come in when someone gets injured. Like we roster, you know, 13 and, and 12 will play each game. And so you could be in and out of, you know, that 13th player, not me mm-hmm. specifically, but that 13th player. So yeah. I had that one-on-one, you know, had this thought in the back of my mind, like, you know, what if I was that 13th guy, you know, you, right. you know, you're not, you're not just the first alternate, you know, you're, you're playable, playable player. And like, you're going to be an Olympian, like the first alternates on Olympian, like, and not right. the two other alternates. So you're like, you know, that's one thing that's hanging there. And so the Wednesday morning came, and I kind of got a little bit of word about it. Like, you know, I hadn't talked to Mike, but he had to talk to other players on the team before me and kind of, you know, explain to them why he had chosen me, which I didn't know at the time. And so I, like, I got a little bit of wind of it, but I didn't know it was, like, real. I didn't know it was real until he came. And it was like, wow. he could, yeah, he pulled me aside, Cody, come here. And he had two chairs and sat me down and was, like, and put out his hand. And, and he just, like, put his hand out and he was like, congratulations. You're, you're going to the Olympics and, and like I shook his hand and like at this point I'm like I'm blown away you know like, I'm like <laughs> was it did, like you know you, you know there's sometimes that feeling where the words you hear the words but there's like a delayed hit of when when it, it goes like oh, intellectually you feel yeah. it but emotionally it's it, it delay, waits a little bit yeah, it was like I, I didn't understand it to be honest I was like why you know I was like whoa like I just couldn't believe it was like this like belief that wasn't gonna be believed to like <laughs> that it was really happening. And he started like talking to me, explaining it, explaining his decision, and saying you know, and you know I was like, of course it's you know how I am. I was like, thank you so much. He goes, you don't have to thank me. You earned this. And I was like, nice. holy, you know, like and those words yeah. kind of stuck with me. Like you know, like uh, you know, I did earn this, and I did, I do deserve to be here, and I deserve to be the person who's going on this team. And so. Uh, 
I just – and this is the middle, like, we're about to go into practice. Like, we got 45 <laughs> minutes until practice, you know? So, did, oh, man, how were you able to practice without distraction for at least that first 10, 15, 20 minutes? Like, I, I, Well, I went to my car, a little privacy, and called my wife. And I was like nice. – you know, finally, you know, let out the emotion. I was, like, crying. I was like, I made the team. And she's, like, in bed, like, what? I'm, like, I, I, I'm going to the Olympics. And, like – and like I had to like quickly like you know five ten minutes spend time with her about that and then you know, I called my my friend I called Ethan he, I, Ethan yeah. was actually the first call I made because I was supposed to go do some coaching with him in Utah we we're gonna go to the um, high school high school and national sevens I was gonna coach you- out there. So I called him. I was like, I can't come. <laughs> <laughs> Bad news. Can't go. Good news. We can't go to the Olympics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. So all these emotions like and and then i'm like heading into practice and i'm like like my head is like and i'm kind of feeling it right now i'm like my head is like dizzy i'm like i can't believe like like you're trying not to be like this happy smile like huge because you just you know like four guys just got told that they're not the ones coming into the right. team so you know you know and then you're, you're not like trying to, you're not trying to be you're not trying to ruin anybody rain on anybody's parade but it's, yeah. it's trying to contain that yeah but you yeah. probably had that like big goofy smile on the for like because it's just you can't help it like it's whenever yeah. you know something good when it's like purely in your heart and you you don't even control your face at that point you're just like wow. yeah so that, that i don't even remember that whole training session at all um <laughs> I, I was like my heart was beating like crazy i just like I, I couldn't even think. I wasn't thinking at all. And then after the training session, Mike brought the team and was like, um, you know, let everybody know that Brett had moved up into the squad and I had moved into 13th. And which was, I got a great reception. It was really cool. You know, guys patted me on the, on the back, on the head. and like, congratulations and everything like that. And that's kind of the moment where I was like, okay, it's, you, you can celebrate. You can be, you can be happy now. Like you can, you, know. you can, and, and I didn't have this week and a half off. Like, you know, I didn't have this week and a half like everybody else to, like, celebrate and just call everybody. And, you know, I'm into another – I had to go eat lunch, come back and train again. <laughs> <laughs> and so at this point, like, the only person I call is my wife and, and Ethan. And, like, you know, and I have to train until the end of the night so I can go, like, have real time to call my parents right. and my brother and, like, all my other friends and, and tell them about it. And so – like I had to like turn from like all this excitement. I had to turn it into like, okay, we need to get the best out of all these practices. To, you right. Know, like, you need to be that supporting player and support the team. And it was it was hard. Like I'll tell you that two three days after I got told it was very hard to like to, like focus and like hone in because like, I had just all these emotions. Like I, that I was going to the Olympics. You know. I mean, I I can imagine. I mean, think about this from from eighteen year old Cody, who was supposed to be a soccer player, a pro soccer player, yeah. shift out. All of a sudden, what twenty eight years old, almost ten years later, you're going to the Olympics, going to the Olympics under rugby, a sport that you found in your last two months, basically of your high school year, and it's just like this culmination of meeting these people who who set up this this series of motions that just the ultimate competition, the yeah. ultimate competition that you, you see your whole life. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was a crazy recognition or like realization that like all my dreams were coming true. And like, I, I've, I've been very vocal about these dreams. My, like the first thing I told Peyton, my wife, when, when she came to one of my rugby matches, it was at Glendale, eight inches of snow, her and her dad, you know, I didn't even, I never, didn't know her dad at the time. And like, what are we doing here? And like, even back then, I was like, I'm gonna be on Team USA. Like, I'm gonna play for Team USA, and I'm gonna go to the Olympics. <laughs> it's just like uh, there's like, holy, it's it's happening. Like, it is happening. Like, you, you, what you said is coming true. Like, it just, it still like feels like I don't, I don't know how what. Sometimes I still don't know. Like, I am a Olympian, but I don't know the feeling. Like, I, <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's it's only been a couple of weeks. Let 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 it let it slowly delay. I, I'm sure you you've already put the O L Y on your your social media. All yeah. right, let let that continue. Let, let let that hit. There's more and more every day. You're just like, I am, I am an Olympian. I am. Yeah. like think about that. You even though it's eleven thousand people that's there. That's that's you are part of a a fraternity not just of of Olympians that have ever been there in all time. You're part of a very small percentage of human history that gets to be there, but you get to be part of an e- a small percentage of rugby people 
who got to be there, let alone within the first two bits of, of rugby people who ever got to be part of the Olympics. Like you set the yeah. tone on yeah. it. Yeah. I'm forever, forever thankful. Like I'm so thankful and like humbled by all of this. Like that's why I'm like, so just relaxed now. It's like, I've worked so hard. I've been so stressed. Like this last year, half working towards that. I have been. You can ask my wife. She's like, you've been a pain in the ass. Like I have been so stressed. You know, I have just wanted it so badly. I want, and like now that you got it, it's like, okay, you know, you you got it. Like now you can now you can go on to the other goals in your life, and you can be yeah. happy about where you're at, and kind of just focus on the, you know, how can you make yourself even better and even greater, leave more of a mark. That's that's amazing. That's amazing. And I have to imagine the experience in Tokyo, even though you guys were restrained within the village, had to have been both surreal and interesting because, you know, you're you're in the presence of basketball, the players and all these other Olympians that have made such huge names for themselves. You know, um, just kind of lastly, can you kind of touch on that a little bit? Like what what was that experience like waiting in the hallway for uh, before this uh, opening ceremony? Yes. Yeah, so- um, I'll, I'll touch on the experiences a little bit. So the opening ceremony, because I was 13th, I actually didn't get to walk in. So I can't touch on that one, but I know okay. that the boys, the boys had an amazing time and like, I got to watch it again. So, um, and I've watched the Olympics opening ceremonies every single year it's ever been a part. So like, that was amazing to be able to watch that, but being around all the athletes, like you don't even recognize, like, to be honest, like, like I recognize like Yao Ming, you know, because the guy towers over everybody else. But, like, <laughs> you're like, beyond, you're like, among greats like you know you're what you're seeing like famous tennis players and like swimmers mm-hmm. and, like, you kind of see them but you're like you don't really know you know they're not they're not dressed up in their suits you know they're just in like right. their, their country's gear you know so you're you're among greatness and it was like it was like one of danny what danny said to us at the beginning of it is like you know it's really easy to get caught up in this feeling of like you're you're surrounded by greatness and these all these greats around you and you can like fanboy but remember that you are a part of them as well so like you guys are on equal at this point you're on equal grounds you know we're all olympians together and so to remember that and that's kind of what what we kind of felt while we were going through and you know i was able to keep us you know calm and cool and collected but you know every every time we were with the boys oh you see who that was you see who that was like you see who that one like, oh really what where and like, yeah right there and you're like damn okay yeah they're Dude. they're here that's that's wild like i it, it, the, it, it it's it's interesting because it's it's a point of being able to celebritize but also be like yo you guys are mad human y'all are all as you you superhuman like you're very bigger than life on on the screen and and from a distance but then you're there and you're like yo you guys also like really regular but really talented regular (laughs) yeah that's that's kind of what like the more and more i grow and the more like recognition i get and like even on tiktok and like social media and through rugby like the more established i become it's like I'm still like the same person. Like I'm still mm-hmm. a person at the end of the day. And I still like, you know, I, I respond to every single, you know, Instagram inbox I ever get, you know, it was like, I'm going to be real as real as I can. I'm going to help people, you know, get to where they want and inspire people. And I'm the same person. I've just, I've, I've just accomplished a little bit more and in, in the things that I wanted to accomplish in life than maybe others. But it's we're we're all human. We're all the same people. We all, you know. I, I still go home and play video games at night. You know. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Man, I love it, Cody. Uh, you know, uh, I I've genuinely enjoyed this. Um, what's what's next for you over these ne- over the rest of this uh the next year? Yeah, so you know, get to relax a little bit right now. So I'm gonna be at Rugby Town, not playing, which will be the first time in eight years. At, Eight years, I played every single year, so I get to watch that. And then we're right back into the series starting in Vancouver in mm-hmm. September. And so hopefully I get, you know, the five stops this fall under my belt. And then, you know, we have eight next next season in the spring. And then we're into the Rugby World Cup, so which I haven't been to one. So um, I'm hoping and, you know, training towards being in the Rugby World Cup and and trying to, you know, get on that top three on that podium for the Rugby World Cup, too. You know? Yeah, I love it. I love so, it. And where can people find you? Uh, you Got to always remember, where can people find you at? Oh, yeah, at Cody Melfi Rugby on Instagram and at Cody Melfi on TikTok. I'd love follows on both of those. And if you ever have a, a question or a message for me, just send it to my Instagram inbox, and I'll get back to you, I promise. <laughs> Yo, Cody, bro, you the man. Thank you again so much. Uh, it's 
it's really it's really great to be able to hear the stories and get to get to get it directly from from the mouth of from a person experiencing it versus you know hearsay and everything around it so thank you so much for even just taking the time yeah no i appreciate you giving me some time too and just kind of getting a little bit more of the story out there because we all have a story and we all would love to share our stories and this is a great platform to do this so thanks Thank you so much, Cody. Dude, that was awesome. We're definitely going to end up doing this again sometime in the future. But, guys, uh, I I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something from it. And, of course, like I said earlier, please check out some of our other podcasts. Pride, we've had some amazing people. Olympians, Chetta M, Benaya Tapper, Charity Williams, of course. We had Cody, as you guys got off. We've had actors in uh, 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 Adam. um, in Adam Gray Hayward, uh, we have uh, coaches Farah Douglas, uh, Matt Upton. We have uh, R- Rugby World Cup captains in Blaine Scully and Tiffany Faye. We've gotten amazing people. We got uh, uh, a great people who are changing the game, like Kyle and Tiana Granby with Roots, Derek Lipskin of Roots, uh, uh, Rashad Lipford of, uh, of North Carolina A and T. Um, just just amazing we got international we got world rugby people like Com- uh, like Katie Sadlier who actually congratulations to her became the chief executive officer for the Commonwealth Games have uh, USA rugby board members like um, Coma Gandhi Fishbin presidents uh, like at Ad- Ado Milby we have so many people and we're continuing to grow because we want to show you what you can truly do when you are a part of this sport. So, guys, thank you so much. Again, please don't forget to like, uh, follow, subscribe, and share this out. And I want you to know, most importantly, though, of everything, I hope you're happy, I hope you're healthy, and I hope you know that you're highly favored. Till next time, cheers.